So then, um, establish this, uh, this is the present moment, here and now, just to be the knower of the way it is. And, and then the, the body and the breath and the state of mind is like this. Now this is simple suggestions are this ways of integrating it into uh, your daily life is wherever you are it's here and now and it's always now and it's always here and then <laughs> the body is like this the breath is like this and the state of mind is the way it is and it just this uh, a kind of continuous Re reflection, it's like a reminding oneself because uh, the uh, world, as we in Buddhism, the world doesn't mean uh, like physical world necessarily, but the world we create. Like we think we all live in the same world, don't we? And we assume that you and I are living in the same world, but actually, in Buddhist terms, we are living in our own worlds. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, you think of the billions of human beings, each living in their own world, is uh, is an interesting way to look at it, rather than assuming we're all living in the same world. And what that means, is when uh, the Buddha talked about the end of the world, it wasn't like Armageddon, or, you know, that kind of uh, total annihilation of the solar system, but it was, uh, the end of the world is, it's here, and like Lung Pao Chao would point to his jitta, it's always here, the, the end of the world is here. These kind of gestures and reminders are very helpful because the world does take us over. I mean, the world we create, our emotional hang-ups and views and opinions and tendencies and reactions to things uh, kind, of, kind of take us over and we get kind of caught in this kind of whirling vortex of habits and then as soon as you begin to see that you know you're kind of caught in this then that point that is the point of awakened pure awareness you know so it's just that that it doesn't seem like much because you're you know, you we we even even the world of meditation, we create a kind of scenario of how meditation should be and what good meditation is and bad meditation and and your meditation and so forth. So that that this the thinking mind is is thinking the thinking mind is a dualistic function of the mind. So when you with, yeah, and of course one thought goes on to the next so it's you know one what they call conceptual proliferation or papancha it just means you start with this you get this impulse and then the thought arises and, and then the proliferation uh, carries on from that stimulation that stimulus and uh, so just trying to figure everything out and think and solve everything analytically, reasonably, logically, you know, it has its good side and function, but it is limited. It's not, it's not liberating to do that. You just wind yourself up more into complicated <coughs> complication. So, uh, mindfulness then, of course, is the only way out of this trap. And, it, and it's always here and now, and it's not it's not a conditioned state. It's not like a, a you know like a concentration, like a uh, a focused attention on something or other. It's just a simple moment of here and now, and then this it's the sense of uh, at this moment when you when you see it when you're no longer just caught in the vortex of thoughts and proliferating tendencies and emotional habits. That's it. This is it. Just this simple attentiveness, and so it's it's like a poise, a kind of poised attitude of just 
receiving, receptive. It's a relaxed thing. It's not like you're pressuring, forcing, and 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 uh, you know, it's not a willful act. It's just a sense of being present, very simple and open and receptive. So these kind of words help us get a kind of an attitude that is most beneficial, you know, of relaxed attention. Now, like attention, sometimes you think, you know, like in the military, you say attention, and then you're supposed to stop too, and you go contract and become very tense, you know. <laughs> so, you know, in the military, in the army, you say attention, and you contract. You don't go. <laughs> <laughs> At least not <coughs> in the military I was in. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, notice that it's like relaxed attention can sound almost like an oxymoron, kind of. It's like, how can you pay attention and relax at the same moment? And uh, because we think of attention maybe as attention on something in particular, you know, like a, attention to the tape recorder, attention to the to the bowl or the book you're reading, but this is uh, attentiveness, mindfulness, uh, awareness, and so this sense of relaxed attention is is a sense of, of it's a well-being attention. It's embracing. It's not divisive. Uh, it's not judgmental. It's not critical. It's just here and now aware and receptive of everything at the moment, you know, so whether you're feeling good or bad or you're feeling healthy or sickly or tired or <clears throat> rested or whatever your your physical, mental, emotional state is, this this uh, mindfulness is, is willing to let it be the way it is. It's not saying, giving any kind of advice about how it should or shouldn't be. So the getting to recognize this state is uh, the whole point. Like in, once you recognize it, and uh, then you cultivate this state of, of relaxed attention, being here and now, and, and in the present, and then you you find that that moment expands, it kind of is, it stops, sustains, you recognize it, then you, <clears throat> you begin to trust it, you know, it's something trustworthy. And, and then that's real pawana, or samaditi, uh, samasangapol, is like the developing, cultivating the Eightfold Path for the Fourth Noble Truth. So that's why you know, in, in, you know, the the uh, just to keep remembering that no matter how much you get wound up or caught up into the world, the problems and personal uh, <coughs> problems that you have, that point where suddenly you just, wait, you just say, "What are you? What am I doing?" And suddenly you're paying attention, and then trust that moment. Don't go into the then we tend to, you know, on a personal level, we, we, then we, we can easily get caught up in self-criticism, you know, saying, oh, I'm not mindful, I can't meditate, I'm hopeless, my mind wanders too much, I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, and then we can be very self-critical or, or dis discouraged because we, you know, we, we get the ideas, but we, and so when, you know, we have this moment of awakened attention, but it's ignored because we, maybe we, it's not what we're really trusting in. We're trusting in maybe getting something more than that, you know, like some profound blissful state or something that, you know, that you would like or imagine or have had maybe some memory of in, in some, at some previous time. So that's where the, this, uh, just the, the simplicity of just being, uh, you know, using the body. Your own body is a focus. It's just 
you know, the, the feeling of just sitting or or standing, walking, lying down. The ordinary postures, they're not, you know, like standing on your head or doing something fantastic, you know, leaping in the air and, and uh, you know, flying or anything. Just the most ordinary movements of your body through the day and night is you're either sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Of course, that implies a movement from one to the other, you know, from sitting to standing and on like that. So, the body thing is, you know, taking it too personally and too, you know, dismissing it or making it more important than it is, it's something to use, you know, it's a container, it's it's a coarse condition, it's easy to observe, uh, it, it limits us, you know, we, we're bound into, we have to live within the limitation of the human forms that we have, and then uh, we, we begin to, uh, you know, just appreciate that rather than uh, ignore it or or resent it or whatever reactions or vanities or tendencies you have in, in regards to your physical condition <clears throat> then the breath and then the, the jitanu pasana, the state of mind now Ajahn Chah was uh, you know, helped me a lot in the early years with this jitanu pasana style because <clears throat> I was, uh, you know, had had to deal with so many frustrating m- mental problems that I, <laughs> that I uh, you know, had to uh, deal with. You know, how do you survive <clears throat> in a in a pl- in a place in a foreign country uh, where you don't can't speak the language and so forth, and uh, in a totally different way of life. You know, living within a monastic structure and and um, different everything so you're, you're getting you're getting you know so many emotional reactions to it that uh, that uh, you know I wouldn't be able to if I was just trying to sort it out or just deal with it with with suppressing trying to suppress or or analyze myself I don't think I could have survived <clears throat> but because of this Jitanu Pasana style, then I I can actually observe my frustration or irritation or stubbornness. You know, it bring up you know the a lot of of uh, rebelliousness in me. You know, because there's all this benign and everybody telling me what to do, and then and then you know they no you don't walk like that. They even I couldn't even walk right. <laughs> and then my yam, they said I carried it like a weapon, like a club. They said, no, no, you've got to carry it on your arm like a woman carries a purse. <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> 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 and, and then uh, sitting pop here, he's uh, excruciating. And every time I change, they say, no, 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 no. And they come on their back and. So, I, you know, I resent a lot of anger, resentment, frustration, aversion. But also, I could, you know, something in me, uh, you know, was, had this trust enough to be aware of it, of my own mental reaction, emotional reaction. And that I could do, you know, it wasn't didn't take language, understanding of Thai language to do that. <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, obvious that the way I'm feeling is like this. Also, like Ajahn Chah saw right at the beginning, he said, you know, you don't have any patience. Maimi kanti barami, pomol ton, Thai, you know. And, and oh, it's true, you know, it, was, it must have been very obvious. Was, uh, I didn't realize I looked so impatient. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Americans were brought up to, not brought up to be patient. <laughs> That's the last thing everyone that ever tells you to be, is patient. And so, 
you know, then living in this style demanded. I mean, otherwise, the only way to survive was through patient endurance, and and so I I did that too, just develop patience with with myself and with the situation I was in. So this was, you know, like being thrown into into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> sink or swim kind of experience. <clears throat> but this this uh, Jatanu Pasana style, I really appreciated because uh, it really interested me. Because you know, suddenly I was not just reacting and just being caught into my emotions without any perspective. I could actually begin to catch myself. You know, see see what I'm doing. See what my you know the the anguish or the grief I was creating in my own mind. Then I do a lot of reflecting, like you know, like because of the <coughs> uh, these the stories about sweeping. Every day before one prayer, we spent hours every afternoon sweeping the ground, all this dust. And and so I didn't particularly like doing this, but I felt, you know, I felt very intimidated. I had to do it, and so I I did it kind of because it, you know I was afraid of the reaction if I didn't do it. <laughs> so I, uh, but I never, you know, I didn't bother to learn how to make a proper broom or anything. So I'd get one that had been nobody wanted so usually a kind of worn out you know the brooms they make for sweeping and and you know like rubbing a stick on the ground you know so actually it was a kind of miserable thing to be doing and and then uh, and we had to sweep even in behind all these trees you know it wasn't just the piles in those days it was everything you know and and uh it seemed to last the whole whole afternoon in this dust, and so one day I was, I was, you know, doing this, and I was just kind of perfunctorily kind of doing. It. And Lumpur Cha comes in, and uh, so I'm coming, and he kind of gives this bright smile and says, "What Papu is suffering, isn't it?" <laughs> And walks on, and then I, 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 my first reaction is, you got it right, so it is. And then, <laughs> and then suddenly I saw, no, it, it isn't. I'm making suffering around what my point. So you begin to, you know, just tune in in a way that, you know, I was creating suffering around the sweeping. The sweeping actually wasn't suffering. It is what it is, you know, but not wanting to do it and and then doing it out of fear of what others might think if I didn't is, is that's the suffering I create. That's my create, and, and you know that and begin to know the difference. Just the, maybe the discomfort of the heat and the dust, and and maybe you don't you're tired and so forth. So that that's. That's just natural dukkha from the being born as a, in the body. But the suffering that of the first noble truth was, uh, you know, the stuff I create around it. So then I began to have this insight that actually sweeping the, it, it's not suffering. It's my not wanting to do it is the dukkha. So once that insight, I had that insight, then I started taking an interest in the sweeping. I started learning how to make a nice broom with a lot of spring in it so you get these wide kind of lovely strokes and the leaves just kind of go like this and, and you got this nice spring in it so it's not like scratching the ground with a stick but you actually, you know, I found it kind of it's quite a pleasant thing to do actually when, when, you, when the attitude changed from just doing it, or resenting doing it, or doing it to get get it over with. You know, this well, do this, get it over with, so I can really meditate. But it was 
it was itself, here and now, attitude was, you know, I saw through the, the suffering, the, you know, the person, the resistance and the aversion that I had towards it, let go of that, and then it is, you know, just, uh, you know, even could enjoy it, and, and, uh, take an interest in what I'm doing, even if, it, you know, like making a, a broom, a very primitive kind of broom they make, you know, with the kind of what strips, you know, very natural kind of <laughs> conditions. And just, you know, so this is like Chitanu Patsana, actually, you know, the way where, say, it's not Jitanopasana if you're just looking and criticizing yourself. If it's not, uh, you know, because you can look at yourself and think, oh, I'm such a stubborn so-and-so or, you know, lazy, or, you know, way we can look at our minds or state of mind and then, then, then uh, if it's, uh, you know, we can be critical of this. I shouldn't feel like this. I should be grateful, I shouldn't be so selfish or vain, and I should be more compassionate. That's not it. It's, it's just observing the, the, the reality of the mood you're in is like this. And you begin to, to just notice that the, is the, is, you know, the things around, is that suffering? Is that making me suffer. Can I blame my suffering on the mosquitoes or on the on the climate or on somebody else? Well, that kind of suffering, that's not the noble truth. That's just the the conditioned realm in its process of changing that I, I have no control over. But in terms of the suffering in the like the first noble truth isn't about hot weather and mosquitoes biting you or being sick, but it's about, uh, you know, well, not wanting that, not wanting to, if you're sick and weak, not wanting it to be like this, is suffering. If you, you know, if you, even when you find something you really like, you know, you're really happy with something, and then, then you want to keep it, and, and you want it to hold on to it, that's suffering. So even, enjoying something pleasant can be a form of suffering because the, along with that if it, there's not mindfulness or wisdom then there's always the the added of wanting to to have it again when it's gone or or resent anything where you know that gets that takes it away from you take that that takes what you like away from you you, you feel angry or even when it's completely yours, there's still the tendency to worry about losing it. So I had another interesting, really powerful moment one time in, in uh, Rome, in Italy. I used to give retreats there and uh, they have a very good Vipassana group in Rome, Corrado Pensa, and, and he'd invite me to give retreats. So I'd, <clears throat> there was one of his uh, students who I knew is a lecturer at the University of Naples and he <clears throat> very nice man became very good friends and he told me one day he said you know he said Ajahn Tomato you know I'm the luckiest man in the world he said I love my job I have a most wonderful wife beautiful wife had a very beautiful wife have good health and I have this lovely daughter everything it's just perfect right now in my life. But I'm worried because I know it's not going to stay this way. <laughs> it's a good reflection, you know, like even at the peak of, of success and pleasure and that. If there's not awareness, if there's not wisdom, then even that is, is, can be a, a form of suffering fear of losing, of changing, of loss. So, you know, like, like here at this time in the Ngan for Ajahn Chah, 
you know, this is a time where many of the, uh, you know, disciples come together. So there's this kind of joy at meeting, coming together, and uh, then there's then there's the the uh, the God itself and going there and listening. Many of you don't can't really enjoy it that much because of the language. Cause everything's in the Eastern dialect or, <laughs> or or Thai, but still, you know, you can be aware of your jit of your jitta, and and that's uh, that's the real practice. You know, whether how much you understand the language or or the the teachings that you that are being given or. Are the your own reactions to the to the uh, kind of lots of people and different ajans and different? Then of course we all get together and have various opinions and views that we dump on each other, and our gripes and complaints and so forth. So, so this is affects you know the the state of mind we're in, uh, and and so like when when people you know complain a lot and and blame a lot then that ha- has its effect on on the people having to listen as well as the, the person involved and so this is uh, you know this this is where the, the sum in our life really getting back to just the simplicity of it what are we here for is like we've got you know the four requisites shelter for the night we had our meal today. Uh, we have something to wear and medicine for illness, and then it's perfect. So then uh, we've, we've got for this moment right now. We've had our meal for the day. We've got a shelter to protect us from the sun and the rain. <laughs> got a robe to wear, <laughs> and we've got all kinds of medicine. And so, so then, then we, this brings us in the state of this is the life of a samana of, of, of gratitude for the requisites offered because we are we don't you know they're offered to us so that we can uh, do this kind of practice this kind of mindfulness practice. So that's our you know that's our profession really is mindfulness, and then. <laughs> And that's our, you know, the, what our, what we're, you know, what the point of this life is about. And then, and then, uh, uh, you know, the conflicts we have with each other, our personal views and opinions, uh, we can be aware of, you know, like attachment to opinions, to my attachment to my opinion. Is that does that lead to peace and calm or joy or happiness and so you know when you listen to monks giving forth opinions and when you listen to yourself with your opinions does that does that lead towards relinquishment and calm or does it lead towards suffering and so you keep asking yourself you know what am I grasping uh, that that I feel angry or upset or miserable or doubtful at this moment. What is it that, that's I'm grasping? And so it's like inquiring and notice wanting something you don't have, not wanting things to be the way they are and on and on like that. <clears throat> like in the Sangha meetings there's always issues and, and opinions so you have, you know, the 14th they'll have all these uh, big ajans meet here from the different of course they'll have strong views about various <laughs> and so Ajahn Kaley I advise you just to watch your jitsu <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know you've got you know people have tendencies towards having very you know, strong views about what's right or wrong or what, how things should or shouldn't be. It's not that that's wrong or anything, I'm not trying to put it down, but 
that's the way, you know, what we have to live with, in, whether it's in monastic life or lay life or whatever. And so it's, it's learning to use it. You know, that's our, that's our profession, that's our duty to observe. We don't have to solve all the problems of, of the Sangha or the world or the country or the monastery or anything. We just, um, you know, we can, nothing can obstruct us from our, you know, our path, which is this way of mindfulness. So it's also, you know, like when, you know, like my in my own life, just seeing how, you know, you hear all kinds of rumors, and you know, people are coming with, with all kinds of issues, and you think, oh my God, I don't. Where can I run? Where can I run away to? <laughs> and uh, and I have these. These friends in the Seychelles Islands <laughs> have invited me there. I keep thinking, I'd like to go to the Seychelles. <laughs> Rather than this God. <laughs> but that is, uh, is suffering. So, so then, you know, before it even happens, I'm creating suffering over something that, you know, hasn't happened yet. And so noticing that, that this dread, you know, that, oh, this issue, this problem. And then, then instead of doing that, then I, I try to practice a sense of welcoming suffering. So, say, fill me with all the complaints <laughs> and... <laughs> and I find that, that, uh, that way I can kind of enjoy my life rather than then get into this mode of, oh, not another problem again, or not another issue. And which is, you know, not wanting things to be like this, is suffering. And so a lot of upayas, you know, you have to figure out for yourself, for your own, your own kind of nature and character. You know, what I'm doing, I'm just sharing how I, what, you know, things that I've used, I've found helpful. But I think everyone, you know, because we're all quite different, have to, you know, develop our own skillful means. Upayas are like skillful means to deal with particular things. It isn't about meditation, like a meditation technique that's going to work for everybody should be doing. But uh, Lung Pong Chan was always praising like good upayas, you know, so you see kind of where you fall apart, where you're weak point is, your Achilles heel, the, the place that, that really triggers off where you lose it, then, then you take an interest in that and find out way of just learning, uh, you know, how to deal, whether you need to, what to do with it or how to, how to relate to it. And, and that, then it, then, it, you know, you're actually using uh, your, your comic uh, Nipaka Kamen, the present, is a way of developing the path. It becomes path knowledge rather than just your personal obstruction or problems uh, that, that are holding you back. And, and the way that we can interpret everything in, in a highly personal, critical way. So I offer this as a reflection for the day.